from Terry Hartman Squire to say a few words, and then you'll bring up the panel. Yeah, I'll bring up four and I'll bring Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isaac and Ravit, for opening your home to us for the screening. Let's hear it for them because it was one phone call, and yes, we'll do it. So thank you so much. And these stories are very important of people with disabilities telling their own stories. And so we support this. And uh, it was just a pleasure to talk to Sarah Burton uh, and Liz Burke, who produced this. Um, we're in the process of, of showing just three screenings in this country for phase one. Sarah and I will come back after the panel and tell you a little bit more about it. But we want to thank you for being here. Um, also, the American Association of People with Disabilities is also co-hosting it. And in Berkeley, we'll be um, there next week and uh, at, in other cities as well. So maybe we should start with the panel. I'm going to introduce Warren Shaw, who will then introduce the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to get myself situated, and, uh, and we'll bring on the panel. While he's being situated, I just wanted to make one point. Um, telethons was a very important through line in this documentary. And there's another story about telethons, which will come up during the panel. But I did want to give a shout out to Lorreen Arbus right here. Uh, those of you that know Lorreen, she is an activist and entrepreneur, second generation. And actually, it was her mother who came up with the idea of telethons in the first place, but for a very different reason, before Jerry Lewis hijacked it to make it a pity party. And that was to bring disability into your home so you would have a firsthand experience of people with disabilities before all the legislation, because there was a tendency to avoid people with disabilities. So we hope that we'll hear about the other side of that story later in the panel. So, panelists, why don't you come up? And I, I will introduce you once you're situated. I'm just going to say, Sarah, sit next to me, please. I can do that. Have enough room? So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Warren Shaw. I'm a, a lawyer. I'm a writer. I'm an historian of the disability rights movement in New York City. In 2015, I curated the first ever museum exhibit on the disability rights movement in New York City. My, <clears throat> my parents, Julius and Molly Shaw, helped found the movement in New York City in the early 60s and 70s, and it's really a pleasure to be with you. Uh, to introduce the panel, Sarah Barton, of course, is the director and co-producer of Defiant Lives. She is well known in her native Australia for her work as an award-winning documentarian with numerous productions in the areas of disability, ethnicity, and psychology. So welcome, Sarah. Uh, on my left is Monica Bartley, a community organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. She's well known for her voting rights advocacy here and for her disability activism in her birthplace, the nation of Jamaica. Welcome, Monica. Thank you, Warren. Further over on uh, next to you is um, Simi Linton, co-director of the Disability Arts NYC, the author of two books, Claiming Disability, Knowledge and Identity, and My Body Politic. And she's a director and the subject of the documentary Invitation to Dance. And on the other side of the table, next 
to Sarah is Carmassi, who uh, has been a force in New York City's disability community since the 1970s, a uh, colleague of both Judy Human and Dr. Howard Rusk, uh, with leadership positions in Sydney, BCID, and DIA, uh, plaintiff in enough ADA suits to get her photograph on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> Carr well, has seen and done it all. <laughs> so welcome, Carr. Um, so I, I would like to start off by talking just with Sarah for a few moments, and, and then we'll open the discussion to the entire panel. Uh, Sarah, first, congratulations uh, on Defiant Lives. Thank, thank you very much. Thank it, you. It's a stunning piece of work, and, and let me just say, I've, I've seen it a few times at home, and, and maybe this is relevant for the phase two marketing business. Seeing it at large scale is vastly different. I mean, having already seen it a couple of times, seeing it here today brought tears to my eyes on any number of moments. So the scale matters, get people to see it in the theatre. I think that's actually a really good message because we designed it in such a way that we really wanted people to see it in theatres and the soundtrack is a really important part of that. And I should add that in other, in a lot of theatres it's actually got a surround sound soundtrack. So this is in stereo but when you have the sa sound all, all around you it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. We had it at Sydney Film Festival a couple of days ago and the sound was just fantastic, so, yeah. <clears throat> so I'd like to ask you, Sarah, how did this film come about and how did it grow into this three-nation international exploration? I, it's kind of crazy because, you know, Australians, we're very good at making films about Australia, but we're not actually that good about at going out into the world and making films that about, you know, how we fit into the larger part of the world. Um, but in 2010, I got a, um, a thing called a Churchill Fellowship, which is a, a, a study grant uh, that allowed me to travel internationally. And I was... I, my proposal was to research a documentary about the history of disability rights, but I decided that I'd better record my research. So I came and I travelled and I brought my camera and my sound gear and I carried it all myself, which was physically quite full on. Um, so I came here to the States and I went to the UK and met a lot of activists and basically I was learning and, you know, I felt like there was a lot of pedalling going on underwater. You know, I was like learning really fast as I was actually recording these interviews with people. And so, and, and I'd managed to do some research about who I should meet, but of course I would arrive somewhere and they're like, oh, are you seeing so-and-so? Are you seeing such and such? It's like, oh, I'm here for, you know, wherever I was, I was only there for a few days. So, so the way I look at this film now is that it's not definitive. I mean, you can't fit the whole rights movement into one film. There are many extremely important people who are not in the film. Obviously, many of the important people are. But there are many people who just... For, for sometimes for really dumb reasons, like, you know, I just wasn't... They weren't in town when I was in town. People like Mike Oliver, he was holidaying in France when I was in England. So, so you know, just that's just how reality gets in the way of, of art. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a history. So let me ask you this. Uh, although the film covers the disability rights movement in three countries, mm -hmm. Australia, Britain and the United States, it, it seems to me that it tells a single story that that it, it is weaves all three locations together, and I think you do a, a very nice job of uh, showing and not telling. But since you're here <laughs> a, a, a on the spot, I'm going to ask you to tell us what you think that how would you give in a narrative form that three nation story of the disability rights movement. Yeah, well, weaving together the three nations is an interesting one because I think we all have different relationships to the way we support, um, certainly the way we support people with disabilities in our community um, and also like our social wel welfare models and that are all quite different. Um, but I did find that they... they, they the activists certainly spoke to each other and there was they were informing and influencing each other. So I tried to kind of show that, those connections, because that helped us move from one country to another. But ultimately, um, the sort of single narrative thread of the film is really from the sort of bad old dark days in the institutions, which is, is a pretty devastating part of the sort of opening of the film. 
um, through to that understanding of people getting out of institutions, the change they made to the environment once they got out and found they couldn't get off the footpath and couldn't get on and off the trains and all of that. So those those sort of physical changes and then that change to getting, um, you know, uh, in-home support, independent living centres, um, that sort of in-home support. But then we move on. So you sort of, you've got all these structural changes to the environment, you've got the personal support de models developing, but then there's this point at which where you think, you know, maybe they've got it all sorted, but then the social model comes up as this idea of taking disability away from an individual impairment and putting it as a social, you know, this is society not catering for us rather than the other way around. Um, and so I think for people who have no experience in disability, the social model is quite a revelation. And it really, certainly I know when I first came across it, it was like, oh, okay, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And I think it really gives people a lot of tools to move forward. So then the explaining of the social model for people who don't know it, and then beyond, how do we get beyond the social model? So I guess what I want people to, to, to come out of the film with is a sense that like, oh, now I understand more whatever it is that I do in my life, whether I'm an architect or a school teacher or a shopkeeper or whatever, whoever I am, there are things I can do better and now I know how I might go about doing that. Um, and then at the very end of the film, we come back to the institutions with the White Flower Memorial as a kind of, um, you know, memorial to the othering that happened at the beginning of the film. So it sort of, it brings the narrative together. I think, reasonably well. Now, there's some discussion in the film about <clears throat> the differences between uh, the movements in the, in the three countries. You get the sense, for example, uh, in Britain, the welfare state is an important component. Um, in, in Australia, there's more of a sense of collectivity. Uh, and, and in America, there's this uh, very intense and, and I think youthfully characterized individualism. Mm -hmm. um, what strikes you as some of the most important similarities or differences uh, in the movements in the three countries? Um, well, I think that, you know, that we were sort of quite clear at, at trying to sort of um, point out the differences, you know, the, the welfare state, the individualism and the kind of what we in Australia called a, a fair go, you know, it's it's a bit... It, it's kind of a bit hopeless in a way, but it's kind of, but at the same time, it's it's a mixture of collectivism and individualism. I think we have um, in Australia, um, and the strengths and weaknesses. I think certainly, I know in Australia, there's a lot of frustration about our our legislation, our Disability Discrimination Act. Um, it's it's pretty. It's not like we look at America's Act and think it's better than ours. But you know, it's, let's, I don't know that that's saying a lot. You know? So I think you know, I think in terms, I think in terms of the sort of onus on individuals. I mean, we've had you know, we had someone take an airline to court, and it, it took years, and it cost a lot of money, and the woman didn't win. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it's 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 pretty bad. And the other thing that we're in the midst of in Australia is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and that is a new way of sort of providing support for people, but. I think we need to be very careful in Australia that we don't think that's the be-all and end-all. Really, this film is to pick up where that leaves off and say, hang on, there's actually a whole lot more. If if the rest of society doesn't get involved and doesn't understand disability rights, then the NDIS can't solve... It's not the solution to all the problems. The, and, and, and the question of where we go next is something we'll be returning to. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sarah. What I'd like to do now is I want to pose a two-part question to each of the other members, members of the panel. Um, first, your thoughts about the depiction of um, the disability rights movement as an international phenomenon, and then to, I'd like you to segue into your personal experience with the disability rights movement, how you got into it, how it's evolved and changed since then, and how it fits into the film's framework. Uh, let's start with you, Monica. Okay. Regarding the disability rights movement as it's depicted in the film, sorry, okay, yeah. We see some common issues in all the three countries. Um, that's the first um, basis. There, the, the problems with disability where we're seen as other disabilities, stigmatized, you're isolated, left out, 
it, that's evident in all three countries. And the institutionalization of people with disabilities, that's also common throughout. Now, I became involved with the disability movement in 1981 um, when we had the International Year of Disabled Persons. That's the United Nations Year. Then we became aware of our rights as people with disabilities. Before that, we were functioning under the rehabilitation model, well, medical rehab model, because people with disabilities in Jamaica were taught to fit back in society as if there was nothing wrong. So there were no accommodations made. You just had to act as if you did not have a disability. So that made us not ask for anything. But when we became aware of what could be done, that, well, we're facing discrimination and so on, then we started to demand more. We too adopted the slogan, nothing about us without us. And we started meeting with government and so on to ask for, for policy changes. What this film has shown is that although we have moved so far over the years, we cannot rest on our laurels. We still have a way to go. We are not there yet. And that is what the, the main message to me from that film is that we have to harness the energies and support of the younger generation because the battle is not yet won. Here, here. Thank you, thank you. Simi? Yeah, I think I'm... Same question. Okay, uh, which part? There were two. Well, uh, you, you, your, <laughs> the reaction, part. your reaction to the, to the depiction of okay. the, the movement as an international phenomenon and your, your personal slice of, of the movement. Okay, um, it was wonderful, and thank you, Sarah, because I got to see uh, many people who I hold dear um, in front of me in a wonderful, powerful way. And uh, I appreciated that very much. I think um, uh, both from the title and on, the, um, the vehemence and the um, wisdom and the, the power of disabled people in the face of, of um, great oppression is depicted um, beautifully. And so it was uh, a pleasure to watch on both personal level and, and in terms of the way I think about things. Um, in terms of my evolution, both becoming a disabled person, uh, a disabled woman, and uh, in fact putting disability first in the way that I describe myself, has been a process. And Carr, I think, was one of the first disabled people I met. I, she worked in the rehab facility that I was in um, for many months uh, following an injury in 1971, and I had never seen someone in a wheelchair having a position, working at a desk, um, thinking about things, answering telephones, and doing stuff. And it was, and it was, I, I barely interacted with you, but I, it was something I saw, I took in, and it meant a great deal to me, um, all those... Thank you, Sammy. ...hundred and million years ago. <laughs> and now we see each other yes. in demonstrations and in, uh, in convenience like this. Um, I, I did many things in... Blah, 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 and then um, uh, in recent years... Uh, I have turned my attention to the arts and the representation of disabled people in the arts. Um, I am uh, particularly interested in how the arts can explore the risk disabled people uh, face, uh, the risk in being, in being out in public, uh, the risk of leaving your apartment, the risk of, um, of watching um, people being demeaned and uh, disregarded. And um, 
it's, it's where I think uh, we can go. And just a second for a plug, Kevin Gotkin sitting here to my left, and I have started an organization called Disability Arts New York City. Uh, our acronym is DANT. And it's about looking at how disability arts and artistry can be um, embraced and, and, and a platform put forward for the city to take it on. Because this film is about the process of coming out. And I think the ultimate coming out is to see us um, not only shouting back, but talking to and formulating and conceptualizing how we want to be uh, seen. So I, I think that can be a very important part of the future of the movement. And I'd like to get to that uh, after uh, one or two more questions. But first, let's, let's, let's hear Carr on her thoughts. Well, first of all, I, well, first of all, the, I was a wreck because this film brought so I'm going to start to cry. So many memories back to me, the people that I know, like somebody was saying, and I just loved it. And by the way, my tattoo is of Adapt logo. <laughs> if it yes. wasn't so cold in here, I would show it to you. <laughs> and, anyway, the similarities. Well, it, I just thought, well, we all have the same problems. You know, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's housing, whether it's education, it's getting more disabled people to get out there. I mean, in America, we like say 20% of us are disabled. And when we have a demonstration, where are all these people? Other minorities, something happens on the TV, they're out there. We are not out there like that. So I, I realize that's one of my similarities. Um, and especially with the uh, uh, the homes, I, w I was thinking of the w Willowbrook that brought to mm -hmm. my mind, you know, because that's when I really start. I got started. I guess I call it my awakening. Uh, my mother, t I first of all, I don't remember not being disabled, and people would say things to my mother. Why is she here? Why don't you put her away? You know, just like the, some of the people in the film. And my mother would say, no, I'm going to take care of her. Well, the thing that hit me is I used to cry. My mother would take me someplace, and they would say, no, she can't come in here because she's a fire hazard. Yeah. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. they don't use that word today, but I know disabled people that have been discriminated against going in restaurants, theaters, you name it. Okay, and our money is just as good as anybody else's, but right. they don't think about that. So I stopped crying. And then I remember meeting people from So Fed Up in Brooklyn, like Pat and Denise and you, Bobby, that you came to work at Rusk uh, you as an intern. L let me just and interrupt because I- I'm I, too long. No, all no, right. it's not that at oh. all. I just want to explain for those who don't know, the meaning of the name so fed up because it's one of the best oh, acronyms right, in history right. it yes. was fo it was founded in the late 1960s at brooklyn college students students oh boy i don't know student don't, of don't every disability it. of every disability to unleash power so fed up wonderful oh. <laughs> sorry so, continue no no so so that was it i met some people then i i heard about disabled in action and i went to judy human's apartment for a meeting and that just got the ball rolling, and I haven't stopped. And I found ADAPT, and uh, I'm not as active, I have to say, as I used to be, but uh, I'm still involved, okay? And my, my, one of my goals is to get young people involved. That's what we're having a problem with in New York. And not just in New York. Oh, okay, that makes me feel better. <laughs> Thank you, Carr. Okay. So, now, the movie is international. Uh, we are here in New York City, and Sarah, you're surrounded by New York City activists. 
<laughs> which is great. <laughs> and, and those of you who know my work, uh, it's very place focused. Uh, I've been working on the history of the disability rights movement and disability in New York City. Uh, I've been working on, on this uh, question or these series of questions for about 10 years now and my, my, my investigation has taken me back to the 1840s up to the present. So. Uh, it's a very long and complex story, but the one thing that I will say about the movement in New York City is that it wasn't started as a deinstitutionalization effort. It was started by, I suppose you might say, people with moderate disabilities who were able to drive and for the most part use mass transit in the bad old days of the 50s and 60s. Uh, it began as a car-centric movement and uh, and then Willowbrook exploded as a controversy, and uh, and the, the 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 subject matter range expanded, uh, and then the Disabled in Action formed in in about 1969, 1970, and a much more radical um, framework uh, grew out of that. But what I wanted to ask. Uh, uh, of the New Yorker panelists um, that I'm sharing the stage with. Uh, New York is sometimes referred to as a failure for the disability rights movement, especially with regard to the subways. Now, as New Yorkers and activists, uh, let's hear about your feelings about the city's place in the American disability rights movement. Whoever wants to take that first, feel free. Well, if we look at the subway, I would think that the changes, first of all, we have had some changes based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, but the changes have been slow. We are not where we want to be as yet. With regard to the subway, we have a system that's not fully accessible for people with disabilities. In fact, it's not that accessible. So it's difficult for people who use wheelchairs to use the system because there are only select stations that have an elevator and the elevators don't work all of the time. In fact, Sydney and the other agencies, Bronx Independent Living, um, BCID and so on, we have just filed a lawsuit against the MTA. And this is as a result of the disrepair of the subway stations, the elevators that are not working, and stations without elevators at all. So we have a subway system that's not accessible. For those who, who may not know, the, the um, current efforts to make sub the subway system accessible to the extent that it is, uh, is based on a political uh, uh, deal that was agreed to by Governor Mario Cuomo uh, about 20 years ago uh, that is supposed to be completed by 2025, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2020, I'm not certain. Uh, and it involves making approximately uh, 100 of the system's 400 stations wheelchair accessible. Not good enough. We, we've got a similar thing happening in Melbourne. We're, we've actually got a reasonably accessible train system. When I think of New York, I mean, we complain about it all the time, but it, the train system basically... Yeah, I, yeah, I, I you, think you can, people in Melbourne and people in New York have some temperamental traits in common. We all, <laughs> we all like to complain. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we do a lot of complaining. But we've got trams and the trams are inaccessible and we have this ridiculous issue where we have some accessible trams mm -hmm. and some accessible tram stops but they can't manage to get the trams and the tram stops to match. So you have, like, accessible trams going on routes where there's absolutely no accessible tram stops and then you've got all the tram stops but they haven't got any... Yeah, it's just crazy stuff all over the world that... You know, That's pretty Pretty good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm on the Public Transport Access Committee, so I deal with vertical access strategies and things like that, mind-numbingly boring stuff, at trying to sort of make things more accessible. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're in common with, uh, you know, cities like New York. So what do you all think about the idea that New York City is, is, represents a failure of the disability rights movement? Anybody uh, want to like tackle that? that? I, I don't like that. Carl, no, let's hear, I, I don't let's think hear that's you. True. No, that's not true. The, the, I, I think we could always be better. We could try more so. 
but I don't think we're a failure. No. Because I've traveled around and we, okay, it took lawsuits to get the buses, to get to the curb ramps, uh, what else? So many things, accessibility, you know, in restaurants and theaters and all this kind of business. But uh, no, and as far as the subways, we are the oldest subway system, to my knowledge, in the world. Except for London's. Except for London? Okay, I take that back. And London's and, just as bad. But we run 24 hours a day. London doesn't do that. No, and no, ci no city is, is more dependent on their subway system uh, than we are. And, and I, I, I'm going to agree with you. And in fact, I'm going to say the notion that, the sit, that New York City represents a failure by the, for the disability movement is an insult yes. to the generations of, uh, of talented men and women uh, who, who led and spearheaded and fought for all the many, many changes that we have brought into being in this city in the last 50 years. Uh, if you could be dropped into the city of 1955, uh, I would defy you to get anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And by contrast now, uh, I'm not saying it's as easy as it should be. It is possible to live and travel and go to school and go to work and go on vacation and go shopping and visit your loved ones and go out and have a good time. None of that was possible uh, for, and for, uh, for people in wheelchairs, let's say, yeah. uh, 50, 55 years ago. I have a can couple I, can, of Oh, go ahead, Simi. I was just going to add something. Sure. Yes, um, do go ahead, Simi. I have a, a couple of different points. One is I haven't been on a subway in 45 years because it's totally impractical and really unusable. Um, and I am so glad that disability rights advocates and these organizations are implementing this suit. Um, the buses are great, but um, I, th I think there's a couple of different ways to talk about successes of the disability rights movement having to do with, you know, various uh, criteria related to employment and other things. And I don't know how the city fares vis-a-vis -vis, um, employment uh, records and so forth. But there are two things I would say. I was, uh, I visited Berkeley in 1975 where it was the first place that I encountered a disability community. And when I came back, I felt very bereft of community because there were some of us and we were scattered and I met with Carr and Anna Fay and, and others um, in, in, in the 70s. But I think right now the New York City disability-based um, community of disability rights activists is very strong and, and very substantial. And so I think that's an important criteria, number one. Uh, number two, in terms of disability arts and artistry, I think we are um, gaining traction in, in other ways, too. So I, I think it's important you know, to think about transportation, but also to think about other um, ways that we are successful in New York. Thank you. So I'm going to change. Oh, can I just say something? Of course. Since I'm a dinosaur, OK, when I started to work, you had, there were no buses. There were the checker caps. And since my wheelchair is small, that's how I got to business school, and that's how I got to work. Fortunately, I was able to drive. And that gave me a lot of freedom. But in those days, you didn't have the buses. You didn't have the subways. You didn't have curb ramps. When I would, when I go shopping and stuff, I'd get in the car, park the car here. Then I wanted to go two blocks, pull the chair in. Now I just push. But so we have made progress. And, and maybe some of the younger people, they haven't been through this. And that's OK. But don't come to me and say, Carr, what do I have to fight for? And I usually say to them, go out and try to get a job, then come and talk to me. <laughs> Thanks, Carr. So um, the last topic that I think we're likely to have time for, I'm going to segue into, uh, into, this, uh, in, into it this way, by segueing out of a, a New York reference. The third disability Pride NYC parade is coming in a, in a month or so. 
And I've heard discussion of the parade as a vehicle to make disability uh, a mainstream minority, if I can put it that way, uh, analogous to the way the gay pride parade uh, has sort of uh, put it, it was in the vanguard of the movement of 30 or 40 years and helped showcase that minority as a potential consumer market. Um, so what do you think? Can, can the disability movement go mainstream? Uh, is this a time to fight or is it a time to join and build common ground? Uh, have political developments of, of the last few months uh, changed your view? Um, and, and obviously there are many aspects to this. We'll have time to probe some of them. But let's start off with this idea of, uh, of, of the mainstream minority. Who wants to tackle that first? Can I just say that that was certainly something I was trying to bring out with the film because I think people feel, so people who have no connection to disability who've seen the film, they're like, I never even knew there was a disability rights movement. And I think that's yeah. shocking. You I know? believe that, yes. yes. But they don't even know. Yeah. And I think that that what what this film is trying to do is to put it out there as like, you know, you know about the gay rights movement, you know about all of these other minorities. We need to acknowledge that this is another movement and that, that you know, sure there are intersectionalities as well, but um, people need to understand what that's about. And, yeah. I, and I think the Pride um, marches, we're certainly looking at doing something similar in Australia, which has never really been done, but, you know, inspired by what happens here. We think that we don't, we would probably wouldn't build it around the ADA because we don't have an ADA. Um, but, but, you know, it's certainly something we're looking at to try and just get people out on the streets a bit more, yeah. Of course, the complication that we have as far as main, making the, the, the disability community a mainstream minority is the problem as the film mentions, of, uh, per, of widespread poverty and unemployment. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk about mainstreaming and poverty, and I mean mainstreaming minority. I don't mean mainstreaming individuals. Not, yeah. I don't mean that at all. So, My observation with the Disability Pride Parade, it allows us to feel a sense of community, and it showcases us a little, but it's not enough in the sense that it doesn't command a great part of the media. I find that media is lacking. We do not get a chance to tell our stories individually. For example, if there's an activist in the disability rights movement, that person should be shown so that um, the, the public can know their contribution to the movement. So well, I, I think that um, one of the things that the, the Gay Pride Parade helped make sort of cultural room for was um, uh, gay people moving into the, the public arena uh, so that eventually you had shows like Queer Eye for, for the straight guy and, and that kind of thing, which I think really has, has helped change the pop culture imagery, and that determines an awful lot of how individuals think about these things. Uh, and yeah, there's, I, I agree with you that the media ha focus on the disability pride parade hasn't been what it could be. And the first parade a couple of years ago, the media tended to get it wrong, describing it as uh, uh, sort of a reward that, that the city was bestowing on, on its disabled citizens when in fact it was really quite the other way around. Uh, it was a party we were throwing for ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think there, are, there yes. are things that people get wrong. And even um, at that parade, the speakers who we have are usually public officials. Why can't it be that people with disabilities take center stage and be there um, telling about ourselves, telling about our struggle, telling about where we are now, just, just showcasing what we're capable of? You know, there aren't that many people in, in the public arena who have disabilities who identify as disabled. I'm thinking, I mean, Itzhak Perlman um, is, is well known. Uh, his disability is well no. known. He doesn't talk about it <laughs> all that me. much. Um, there, there was, um, uh, there, there's Jonathan Hockenberry who's been a little ambiguous on the subject. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was an attempt to reboot the, the, the TV series Ironside with uh, Blair Underwood, who's a fine actor. Uh, that uh, show, I think, lasted... It was a disaster. Two episodes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank goodness. 
Simi, I, I get the sense you want to jump in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> first of all, there are many people that I would like to see up on the stage who are spokespeople and, and could say important things. I think we have to um, challenge the term pride, though, and think about it. Um, what, what is not known, I think, as the film shows and what we've been talking about, is that there is a disability rights movement. Pride is a deflection from that. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a disability pride parade. Let's go out. I had a great time last year. Got a sunburn. It was, it was <laughs> terrific. But the, the notion of pride is, is, it has to do with an individual and how an individual feels about him or herself and about the community that we are part of. And um, I, I, I find it a, an awkward concept to begin with, and that's another story. But I don't think that that really does the trick in terms of bringing attention to uh, the oppression and discrimination that we face. I think it, it, it does touch on some of the oppression um, in that um, I, I don't feel proud of being disabled. I feel proud of, of what Dis what I've done with this ability. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I really understand the term, but I think it is a deflection from the grittier and more difficult issues related to disability rights that we face. Uh, yeah, I agree. It is and, not, it, it, it's not um, mm -hmm. a confrontational take on who we are. Right, no, and even in, in the Gay Pride Parade this year, there was controversy about having a political uh, constituency within the parade as if it might damage uh, that parade. Um, so, and, and Kevin can address that um, as but well. But perhaps this raises the question of strategies for our moment. And it seems to me that, that the disability rights movement, broadly speaking, has, has two fights to, to wage. One is the fight against enforced uh, dependence, which is where the fight for rights and barriers legislation and accessible physical uh, uh, plant uh, and so forth and warehousing people in institutions, that's where that comes in. The other uh, piece, the other big fight is against this mythic image that people with disabilities are helpless and not self-sufficient. And um, the fight against telephones is an example of a fight against uh, that, that lands on that side of the ledger. Uh, but what, what does the panel think? Which of those do you think is more, if, is more uppermost at the moment? And, and is this a time to fight or a time to build coalition or, or what? God, maybe all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I just feel Society does not take us seriously, okay? And what I really found that out is when we had the march after inauguration. I didn't do that whole thing from the UN to the Trump Tower or wherever, but I did part of it. When I was pushing, people would say, oh, it's so nice of you to be here. Oh, it's so nice of you to be here. Now, the other people, <coughs> wheelchair users that I know, that did it from the UN, they got the same thing. It was like, oh, it's so nice you're out today. That's what I was getting. They don't as if they, as if your rights as citizen aren't on the of, line too. A movement. I don't think people believe that. And I think when they see us demonstrating and all that, they think we're crazy. <laughs> well, you know, there is there is I, uh, I mean, like, what are you doing there? You know, you get this, you get that. No, we don't get this, and we don't get that. But there is this sort of backlash <laughs> idea. This, the, you know, the 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 the, the, the disability movement was attacked in that book from 20 years ago, The Death of Common Sense. Um, you you have uh, the backlash against the ADA, which was the basis of that ridiculous Times article. Although they did run a beautiful photo of you, Carr. Um, yes, which I never got. <laughs> uh, I remember there was a reader comment on the New York Post's uh, article, the obituary for Harry Weider, something along the lines oh, of okay. some awful statement along the lines. Of course, he had time for activism. He didn't have he didn't have to work. Uh, 
it, it, these are really terrible attitudes, uh, and, and, and especially when the reality of our community is widespread poverty. Um, what do you think, Warren? I'm afraid before you ask your next question that we're running out of time here. Oh, okay. But we'll make this our last question. What do we do about this attitude problem among the non-disabled uh, retrograde types? <laughs> we make art. <laughs> yeah. Do we say, as a Britisher might? I can't do the accent. Piss off. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> or bugger off. That's what we'd say. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Bugger off. <laughs> well, I, 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 I just feel, and it took me a long time, even though I've been the same as I can remember, you have to be so proud of yourself and be comfortable with yourself and forget. I went through a period in my life where I always felt that I had to make people feel comfortable. And that's the word, we make people feel uncomfortable. And when I said to myself, screw you, honey, I am here and you have to put up with me. And I think when more disabled people feel that way, we'll have, we got it made. Yeah. Here, here, but I'll, I'll add to that, that the more we get out there and, and people get to know us, the yeah, less important disability becomes. Yeah. Because as you become known as an individual, <laughs> you become known as an individual. And the, the, your wheelchair is just a thing. Oh, no. no. Oh, no. No. I, I, Go on. No, it's part of me. Yeah. It's part of me. Jump on it. Go ahead. I, I think what it's we really want me. to change is that image uh, that people have of us, uh, that image of dependency, which seems to be embedded in our culture. We want to, I don't know how we're going to go about it, but we need to change that image where they see us as people with power. We are our own person like anybody else, people who are in charge and control of their lives. And until we get to that point, we'll still have people being standing in, in the way of people who want to transition from the nursing homes and so on, because they will see them as people who are dependent and um, cannot manage on their own. So we need to just change that whole mindset that uh, maybe it helps with the media, changing how we are portrayed in the media contributes to that. So we could change our media images and have more positive, showing us in a more powerful, in control of person in our wheelchairs. Do I don't want to get they rid of my wheelchair. Power. I just want to be seen as a person of power in my wheelchair. Folks, before we, before we thank our panelists, I wanted to hand the microphone over one more time to Terry and Sarah to talk, uh, give us one, tell us what to do with this movie. I, I'm not, I think I kind of disagree with you more, but I think it's that boils down to who owns the narrative and who's telling that story. And there's people in this room that have been working in that for, area for years. Um, Simi's invitation to dance. Uh, and disability studies and inclusion in the arts has been helping with casting and portrayals and authentic storylines. And Lorene Arbus has a dozen scholarships for filmmakers with disabilities and lights, camera access and the NYU Ability Lab. And um, what we're doing with CBS News and an internship in a newsroom and what the Ruderman Foundation is doing in challenging every single pilot to hire people with disabilities and audition them. So it changes the landscape and they own the narrative. And I think that's the roots here in New York, that New Yorkers don't put up with any other bullshit. And it was great to, what you have done is you brought back that narrative as a filmmaker. You didn't insert your opinion as a non-disabled ally. You let the camera run. You showed archival footage. You showed the fabric of, and the mosaic of people with diverse disabilities. And it was a beautiful film and a lightning rod for this moment, which I do agree with you, in what's happening politically in this country and how people with disabilities can reclaim that narrative. So Sarah and I have been talking, and Liz Burt, uh, the other producer, about how can we seize the moment in this film around the country in disability studies classrooms, in colleges and universities, in community grassroots screenings, so that the community frames this beautiful film and opportunity that Sarah created, and that becomes the narrative in the media. 
So it can't come from non-disabled allies. It's got to come from the community. Yes. So, can, can I just explain briefly what we're doing in, in terms of the rollout of the film? Um, we've got a, a distribution company called Demand Film and Defiant Lives is their first American release, so you won't have heard oh, from okay. them before. Okay. Um, and they run a different model from traditional distributors which actually allows a film like ours to be seen in cinemas because otherwise it's, it's not a film that you're going to see in a cinema unless you use one of these new models. So basically they use um, cinema, all kinds of cinemas any cinema that's accessible, they're very, very big on access. Um, and they generally book them in off-peak times. So you, not Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. It's more like Monday night, Wednesday night, Saturday afternoon maybe, you know, Sunday, off-peak times. And so they have a website which uh, you can access from our... So if you just go to our website, which is defiantlives.com, and look under cinema screenings, you go straight to their website, they will have... They'll have some screenings already listed because we want to sort of kick-start the momentum and people can just buy a ticket. And the way it works is that once we sell about 65 tickets to a screening, it's then considered viable and so the screening will go ahead. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Awesome. If we don't sell enough tickets, we might go back to people and say, look, that's that screening's not happening, but here's another one. You might want to transfer your ticket to that one. So people commit to buy a ticket. It's like crowdsourcing. Once we've reached the threshold, the ticket gets paid for, you've got your ticket already, you turn up on the on the day. So what we like to get is someone who is the promoter or the host of the screening. We do all the bookings, we do all of the behind the scenes stuff, but we like to have someone who's actually driving the audience and saying, come to our screening, come to our screening. So for that, the, the host actually gets 5% of the box office. So if they want to donate that or use it for themselves, that they can use that however they they wish, but that's a sort of um, acknowledgement for the work they do in publicising the screening. So it basically, and you can, so you can either go onto our website and just buy a ticket to a screening, or if there's not a screening in your area, you might think about, you know, do I want to host something, or do I want to ask someone else or an organisation to host a screening, so that then you can buy a ticket in your area. So that hopefully explains how demand film works. It's a, it, it's quite new. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah. So and when like, is it going to be in New York? Here? Uh, so Manhattan. we're looking at releasing around the ADA anniversary time. So okay, we will the end in, of July then. Yeah, yeah, so in the next couple of weeks we'll put up some screenings and then it's just the success of it really depends on you, you know, how many people and yeah. organisations you want to tell and, and actually to get people to go and buy tickets. But the other thing is that it can be a long, slow burn. So so it's not like you know you've got everyone's got to go in the first weekend to make it a hit. You know it will be we'll be doing this in cinemas for a few months. So you might say, look, I really don't want. I'm busy in July and and really I want to have a screening in September. That's fine. You know we won't be doing anything. It won't be we will be selling to TV stations, but that won't be till next year. So really we can you know it can be a bit of a a, a long slow burn. So d does anyone have any questions about that before we wrap up? Or yeah. Um, what about, um, so, for example, I'm at New York University and we have a Center for Disability Studies and we sponsor screenings all the time. Do we need to use the same demand model or can we... We, we, have, we have another um, tab there. So we're trying to do cinema screenings first and then community screenings a little bit after that. So there is another tab on the website which is about community screenings. So we've got licenses for, like, universities or other organisations who might want to host a screening and have people come for free. Um, generally, we probably have a couple of months with the cinema first and then we'll do the community screenings a little bit after that. I don't have the exact dates, as, but if you had a date in mind, you could contact us and we could see if that's going to work. Right, so, and typically we would also obviously, um, you know, pay for the screening yeah. to support that. So I'll work it out on your website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all it's all there on the website and you can just contact us and, and ask a question or go through the distributor, which means less questions for me, but you can do either, you know, and we can work it out. So that's the, we want as many of those kind of screenings as possible. Um, but not everyone's in a university. So, so we, you know, the first opportunities for individuals just to buy a ticket, come and see it. Isaac, do we have a, a minute for any other questions? Are there any other other questions? And of course, people can stay around and continue to discuss. And then at four p.m. sharp, we'll kick you all out. <laughs> I just wanted to say that this is all great, 
But do you realize that if the administration passes the Health Care Act, disabled people are really back at the beginning. People in the community will get their own care. And uh, this is like the most pressing issue of our times. That's exactly why the the why Carr brought out the absurdity of the reaction to her presence at the the march after the election right yes you know as if it's, as if your rights as a citizen weren't on the block along with everyone else's i want to thank uh, warren and this amazing panel of uh, special guests and experts um i want to thank uh, terry and sarah for bringing us this film together and sarah making a beautiful film that uh, um we hope with real abilities also to help get out there and thank you all for coming and helping spread the word and being a part of uh, this movement. And um, we look forward to seeing you at other great events. And we're going to be sending you evaluations so you can help us frame the marketing. Oh, okay. We're going to Berkeley.